Hey yo, two wheel friends, Zach Cords here with Revzilla and welcome to another episode of Daily Rider. Our guest today is the Ducati Diavel V4. It has 168 horsepower, it has state of the art electronics, and it has an MSRP of just about $27,000. It's a motorcycle, obviously, but what kind of motorcycle it is specifically has been a topic of debate ever since it poked its head out of the Italian underworld more than 10 years ago now. Is it a low, naked sport bike that's fat at the back, or is it a tall cruiser that handles a little better? Nobody seems quite sure. So today on The Daily Ride, of course, we will talk about how the Diablo V4 works as a motorcycle. Maybe, just maybe though, we'll come up with a new definition for the Diablo. Maybe. Buckle up, everybody. Let's ride to work. All right, everybody, Ducati Diavo V4, just about ready to go. As usual, a friendly reminder that this video is brought to you by Revzilla, the YouTube channel that you are watching. Revzilla makes money by selling things to motorcycle enthusiasts, such as yourself. Uh, then we take some of that money that we make from selling parts and accessories, and we put it into video content like this, or DIY tips in the shop manual, or the High Side Low Side podcast, or CTXP adventures in the hopes that it will make the motorcycling world a more informed and more entertained and a better place. So the next time you need something for you or your bike, please do think of Revzilla and we thank you for watching. We'll start with the engine as we often do. This is a 1,158 cc V4. You can see the front bank of cylinders here. It's a 90 degree V4. So the back bank is here. Uh, this isn't actually the top of the cylinder. This is a piece of plastic that's uh, put over here to look like a cylinder, <laughs> which is sort of both clever and a little bit odd, uh, but it does help show the um, the aesthetic of the engine a little bit. Uh, this is largely the same engine that is in the Multistrada V4 Rally, aside from the exhaust, an airbox, and a shorter first gear, which we'll hopefully talk a little bit more about later. The Diablo V4 also uses an aluminum uh, monocoque style frame uh, up here underneath all this plastic here, which goes away from the steel trellis frame that the previous Diablo had. And that, along with some other tweaks and the engine actually being more compact than the previous V-Twin, this bike is around 20 pounds lighter, so says Ducati, than the outgoing Diablo 1260, which is um, pretty impressive considering it has two more cylinders and a more complex engine. As for chassis bits, of course, all the sort of like high spec Ducati stuff that you'd expect, Brembo calipers, 330 mil rotors, which are pretty beefy. It's a Marzocchi fork that is fully adjustable, not electronic, but fully adjustable. Um, then now back, of course, is sort of the, <laughs> I don't know, the, the statement piece of the Diablo. This is a 240 section rear tire, which is quite wide as you can see. <laughs> and of course, single-sided swing arm with this contrast cut wheel. It's very loud and the sort of rocket launcher quad exhaust here. It's a very statement bike and this is uh, a big part of it. It's a little hard to see right now, but this is also kind of interesting. This is the taillight. It's an array of LEDs that emit red light out of these little grills underneath the seat here, which is pretty nifty. And uh, yeah, if you're not familiar with it, check out some pictures of it. I recommend it. Aside from that, it is a uh, Saks rear shock. Again, not electronic, but fully adjustable, which is nice. A couple things I'd like you to take note of while we're at the back of the bike here. This uh, big shield here, which is covering the the uh, pipes coming out of the rear bank of cylinders here to try and keep heat away from the rider. And um, engine heat with a big powerful motorcycle is always a topic of discussion, especially Ducatis or any motorcycle that has pipes that come out the back of the engine like this. So keep that little shield in mind when we're talking about that later. The last thing I wanted to talk about is a piece of design in the back here, or a few pieces of design I think that are pretty interesting. One is the passenger pegs that fold out um, from the tail section here, which I think is kind of a uh, simple but uh, but fairly elegant way to handle the passenger peg. Tucked behind the passenger peg here when you fold it down is the key slot to get the rear seat off. Uh, the rear seat comes actually with a little cowl on it uh, with a few little Allen bolts that comes off and the passenger accommodations are open, which of course I've left so that we can talk about passenger accommodations. If you do pop the rear saddle off here, you can pull up on this little knob and then slide this passenger grab rail out um, so that when the passenger seat is installed, uh, whoever's riding back there has a little bit of support if they would like it. None of this is ultimately super important for the, all the aspects of the bike. I just think it's all really nifty design work. And I think it's important to keep stuff like these little details in mind when talking about a big complicated motorcycle and um, how it all works. Because first of all, it's expensive. And I think it's important to remember that bikes like this are often more thoughtfully designed than we give them credit for. And in the context of this video, I of course will forget 
many aspects of this motorcycle <laughs> and that's a good example of why because there's lots of stuff to talk about so let's fire this bad melberg up here this five inch tft gets all spun up here very complicated dense dash situation which we'll talk about later and we can uh bring this engine to life yeah <laughs> Let's do it, everybody. All right, now that we're up to speed, we're gonna hit a red light, but we should start talking about specs already. By gosh, I did quote the MSRP at $27,000, which is a little unfair to the Diablo. I believe MSRP for the red version I'm riding is $26,700. Dollars. I rounded up to 27,000. Hopefully you'll forgive me. Other specs, uh, down at a stoplight, we can talk about the 31.1 inch seat height, which at six foot two allows me to flat foot quite easily. Fairly approachable bike from the standpoint of yeah, seat height and, uh, and it's pretty narrow in the middle, which is nice. Um, the engine makes a claimed 168 horsepower and 93 foot pounds of torque, which makes it a little less approachable. I think we can agree. <laughs> That is slightly less horsepower than uh, some versions of the Multistrada claim. 5.3 gallons of gas in the tank, and when it was full on the Daily Rider scales, this sucker weighed in at 523 pounds. Again, less approachable than the uh, short seat height would suggest. But that's what you get with a muscle cruiser, or a power cruiser, or whatever it's called, however we define it. We still haven't figured that out, have we? Maybe that's getting ahead of ourselves anyway, right? We got, uh, we got some riding to do first, I think. As long as this light turns green sometime soon. There we go, and we're off, everybody. Just in time for another red light. And the overall ergonomics are also fairly unique, I would say. The foot pegs are sort of mid-mounted, uh, so just, just under your knees. And, um, sorry, this person's making me very nervous. Not sure if they've driven before. Um, anyway, the reach to the handlebar is actually not quite as aggressive as it was on the previous model. It's moved back about three quarters of an inch, but still fairly upright, as I remember the old Diablo anyway being fairly upright, and this one feels pretty comparable despite that change. Um, and because the saddle is kind of low and wide, uh, it all adds up to a pretty comfortable riding position. Very unique, not unlike the bike. And uh, now that we're going a little faster, friendly reminder that it has cruise control, which you can turn on with this button and then set with this button. And now we're cruising. It's not the fancy radar controlled adaptive cruise that you find on some Multistrada models. It's just your standard cruise. Any motorcycle that has basic state-of-the-art ride-by-wire technology should have cruise control, in my opinion. And uh, especially one that costs the better part of 30 grand. And I think Ducati knows that. So, you know, kudos to the Italians for answering everyone's call there. So as we cruise along the open road here, this is usually where we talk about fuel range and efficiency. And there's actually lots to talk about with the Diablo V4 because first of all, it's a big V4 engine, right? Uh, it grew from uh, the Panigale V4 initially, which is Ducati Superbike, which is not meant to be efficient or have any real touring chops. This engine has made a lot of um, evolutions over the course of its life, the Ducati V4. This is the Gran Turismo version of the V4, which means it does not have the desmodromic uh, valve actuation. It has valve springs, like most other engines in the world do, which is a departure for Ducati, but that's a whole separate podcast. We're not going to get into that too specifically right now. The point is, it is more of the touring version of Ducati's high-performance V4. Perhaps because of that, Ducati has added a couple features to it that speak to um, maybe efficiency or everyday life. The main one being cylinder deactivation, which I believe the Panigale and I know the Street Fighter V4 has, which when you're sitting at a stoplight and the engine is at idle, it will, depending on how hot it is, shut off the rear two cylinders in the bank of V4 to save fuel and to save a little bit of heat. Uh, this engine takes it a step further, which is to deactivate cylinders below 4,000 RPM uh, above first gear while you're riding. So for example, if we were to slow down right now um, and go below 4,000 RPM in fifth gear, for example, let me 
make sure no one's behind us, we're not in anyone's way. Uh, you'll feel a slight tone change in the engine and a slight change in character in the motorcycle, which is very interesting. And yeah, it's those two cylinders in the back shutting off to save fuel. But to get back to the point, <laughs> sorry, got a little sidetrack there talking about, you know, cylinders deactivating and whatnot. This is a 5.3 gallon fuel tank and fuel mileage numbers that we got here at Revzilla West. The low figure was about 30 miles a gallon, which is pretty bad. And the high mileage figure was, I think, around 40, which is uh, good, not great. If you really hoss on the throttle a lot and have a lot of fun with this engine, it's gonna use a lot of fuel because it makes a lot of power. That's how baking power works, you use fuel. To take a sharp pivot away from engine dynamics, we can talk about the mirrors. And I think that's important to do in the context of the praises that I just sung for the engine and its efficiency and its technology and all of the things that it can do and how impressed I am with it. <laughs> because the mirrors suck. They're just hard to adjust. I can't actually get it to show me down and away next to me so I can see cars that are next to me. I can kind of see behind me, but they're kind of vibey and they're not the right shape and they're a pain to adjust. And it is fascinating to me that a company uh, any motorcycle company, frankly, but especially one that has the ability to design an engineer, an engine that shuts off the rear two cylinders to save fuel and only has valve checks every 36 or 37,000 miles because of how well built it is, would struggle to build mirrors that just work and show me the part of the road behind me that I want to see. But the Diavol is an enigma. Maybe, hey, maybe we're getting a little closer to that definition. Okay, okay. Anyway, um, time for the stop sign challenge where I try to come to zero miles per hour and keep my feet on the pegs. I have, however, failed to do a footless stop thus far. I think we, let's, we can do it. We can do it. Yes. A little bit, a little bit inelegant, but, um, but I got it. Oh, the engine's doing the thing. Could you hear that little tone change? It was brrr. Now it's only running on two cylinders. Because we're above first gear and we're below 4,000 RPM. <laughs> Anywho, the other thing that the Diablo has going for it is that everything is very precise and well built. And that's just a, I don't know, it's a facet of how Ducati builds motorcycles. It's a facet of paying 27 grand for a motorcycle. I'm not sure exactly how you want to couch it, but the clutch feel is predictable. I think the levers are adjustable, the brakes are sharp, the fueling is remarkably kind of progressive and predictable considering it's sort of an ornery beast, right? This bike is, is uh, it even sounds and acts a little bit ornery sometimes. Like it, it pops and sputters sometimes, but it's never actually difficult to use, which is a, a big change from Ducati's of, I don't know, five years ago, definitely 10 years ago, when they were actually kind of difficult and, <laughs> and a little bit impractical. But this bike just sort of acts a little bit demonic but it doesn't actually feel that way when you're in the saddle. And I think that's a pretty big credit to Ducati for that. All right, as we approach the stoplight, I think we're gonna need more than one stoplight to talk about all the stuff in this dash. Can you see, is there glare? I'm trying to see if there's glare. I don't think there's really bad glare. Gosh, I hope not. Of course, you got your, uh, your little analog tachometer on the side here, big gear position indicator in the middle. And then over on the left here, you have all of the data points and stuff that you can adjust, which is done with this toggle here. If you hold down on this upper button, uh, a cursor is gonna jump from up here to down here, and that'll allow me to scroll through these, um, all these pieces of data here. Trip one, trip two, uh, average fuel mileage, range, blah, 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 um, odometer, stuff like that. If I hold up again and go up to the setting menu is where I can dive into adjusting riding modes, adjusting almost everything. Ducati's really good, in my opinion, about allowing the rider to make lots of changes. If you go into riding modes, for example, touring, sport, uh, wet, and urban are the four riding modes. And in each of those modes, you're allowed to adjust basically any parameter that you like. Track control level, wheelie control level, ABS level, all that stuff. Corvette guy. Uh, Corvette guy's got to appreciate a Diavel. Muscle bike, muscle car. Is a Corvette a muscle car? Or is it a, a sports car, I suppose? Well, it's not a sport bike. But it's not, not just a muscle bike either, is it? <sighs> it's so hard, it's so hard. Yeah. 
good footless stop to finish out the stop sign challenge. I like that. All right, time for a passenger accommodation test. Why not? Uh, we can hop back there since we got cruise control and experiment with this platform, which is surprisingly reasonable. The foot pegs that I was um, glowing about earlier that I think are so elegant that fold out do put your feet in kind of a wide position, which is a little strange, but the perch in general is quite nice, actually. It's it's quite wide, just like the rest of the back of the motorcycle. <laughs> and, uh, you know, doing like a long road trip like this, you'd probably want the little uh, sissy bar accessory thing that Ducati sells. Taller passengers are going to be annoyed that there's not a lot of leg room. You have a pretty sharp bend to your knee. But, uh, you know, in general, I, I have trouble being disappointed with the passenger accommodations considering, I don't know, a passenger's just not the point of this bike. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you're just getting lucky for having a, a wide caboose, uh, Diavel, but uh, even if that's the case, props. All right, we dive into the twisty road section of the Daily Rider route here. Obviously some construction. And Twisty Roads is where the Diavel always sort of defies people's expectations because it's got that big beefy rear tire and it looks like a cruiser, sort of. And uh, you don't expect to be able to sling it through curves like this and trail break and, and just ask it to lean over. And it does it pretty willingly. It doesn't feel exactly like a naked sport bike or, or a you know, sort of standard motorcycle because of that big fat rear tire. That 240 section rear tire means it tips into corners quite well. Ducati's good at that kind of thing. Once you're on the edge of the tire like this, you can feel the back tire pushing on you a little bit. Like it, it wants to stand up. And that's kind of understandable. And is it silly from a handling perspective to have a tire that's that wide back there? Yeah, it is. It doesn't make sense. But, you know, the bike is what it is. It, it's, it's supposed to be <laughs> this burly, bruising statement piece. And um, the fact that Ducati has made it work so well in a set of curves, even with that, yeah, big, big fat tire on the back there is, is impressive and pretty fun. All right, yellow lights. Let's talk about brakes. Um, here we go. Engage in the ABS. A little bit of rear brake, as I talked about riding that Honda Shadow uh, a little while ago on Daily Rider. A little bit of rear brake is good to use. But in general, the componentry on these brakes is basically the best that you can get in the world. Um, the Brembo Stylema calipers, the braided lines, it's big rotors, it's good rubber, it's uh good tires that is and i mean this bike stops amazingly well and um you know it stops really well for the same reason that it goes really well which is that it's low all right so this is part of the ride where we talk about the engine i know we already talked about the engine and its technology but this is usually where we talk about the culture of the engine whether or not you would purchase this motorcycle just for the engine and it's an interesting question with the diablo because yes the Ducati V4 is a technological tour de force. But because the Diavel's reaching for this sort of power cruiser, muscle cruiser style a little bit, you wonder if the V4 is more of a departure from what the Diavel represents than the old 1260 V-Twin. Now you can't blame Ducati for moving in that direction, right? It was Pentagali V4, it was Street Fighter V4, it was Multistrada V4. Obviously all the flagship models are getting V4s in the Ducati lineup, and that's understandable. I don't think having a V4 is less desirable than having the last generation V-Twin, personally. But if someone had that point of view, I, I wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't blame them. The thing that really does it for me is the fact that the engine is so just dynamic and fun and zesty. <laughs> if I felt like the old engine really had something to offer that this didn't, something significant anyway, aside from the number of cylinders, I might say that it's better, but I don't think it is. So we're coming to the end of the ride now, and uh, I, I made a suggestion that I would try to redefine the Diablo, come up with some way to put it, but I don't think that I have. What else does it sort of compare to? I guess the most obvious comparison, I think, is the Triumph Rocket 3, which is a enormous um, yeah, muscle cruiser thing that Triumph builds that's also awesome for a bunch of reasons. But the, but the Rocket 3 is different from this bike, too. Yeah, you can take it through some curves, and um, but the Triumph Rocket 3 has got a 150 section front tire. It's got a big, fat front tire as well as a big, fat rear tire. Um, and the motor is just monstrous. I mean, it's like 
tire spinning torque whenever you want it. And the Diablo is more of a scalpel. It's more of a, it's, it isn't a scalpel. That's the wrong analogy to use, but it's more precise. It's more sporty. It's more agile. It's lighter. It's smaller. Um, it's more precise. And all of that is to say, I don't have a new way to describe this bike. And I think that's one of my favorite things about it, that you can't just say, oh, it's that thing. If anything, what you say is, it's a Diavel. And that means something in the world of motorcycling now because of the sort of, yeah, the legend that, that Ducati has created <laughs> by, uh, by coming out with this bike ultimately and, and sticking with it. And I think that's cool. I think that's a fun uh, pedigree to have, to be forging a new path all along. How does it do on a dirt road, you ask? Well, we are about to find out. So we're gonna leave it in urban mode for now. <laughs> uh, and I think we should experiment with the trash control, especially. So urban mode, you see that orange light flashing here? Let's try wet mode. Let's just see if it's different. So now we're in wet, rain mode basically. Oh yeah, I think it's even more conservative. Yep, that makes sense, I guess. <laughs> uh, and then let's try touring again. So now we're back to turismo mode. And we can try the traction control again. And this is uh, more, more horsepower on tap now, of course. <laughs> Still pretty conservative. Still pretty conservative. Let's, uh, let's just go for sport mode. Oops. Sport mode. Come on. We got time. We got time. We can do it. Oh, these big sandy ruts. Ah. <laughs> it doesn't love that. It doesn't love it. Uh, is this? That's TC1. That's the, sort of uh, the most relaxed traction control mode. <laughs> I didn't have time to turn TC off. Sorry. But you know what would have happened? It would have gone ballistic is what it would have done. <laughs> Uh, let's go into sport here and make sure that we have, yeah, I'm just going to shut traction control off and then I think, yeah, we got wheelie control off and that for those who watch Daily Rider on the reg will be pretty obvious why we have those things off. Oh yeah. We're ready. Time to find out whether or not the Ducati Diablo will do a wheelie. Do you think that 168 horsepower is enough, even though it's so long and low? Do you think it'll still do a wheelie? <laughs> yeah, you can bet your dinner it does wheelies. Holy shisa. <laughs> it is rowdy. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's so much fun. Okay, last question. Can you back it in on a Diablo? Why, yes, you can. <laughs> Why can you shut off rear ABS on a Diablo? Why? Why would you want to do that? I don't know, but I love it because they're crazy over there in Italy. <laughs> it just doesn't have the, the, you know, it's not the style of bike where <laughs> you'd think that that would be a priority, but you can do it. <laughs> oh, it's so flipping rowdy and so awesome. It's awesome. Well, the U-turn challenge will not be quite as thrilling as always, but we got to give it a try. Got to give it a try. I'm going to line up on this line here. We're going to go full lock left. We're going to go feet up. Oh, I screwed it up. Okay, let's back up. Let's try again. Let's try again. Let's try again. We're going to go like this. Full lock left. Uh, two parking spaces, 2.1 maybe. Not bad, not bad for 62 inch wheelbase and 170 horsepower, you know? I would say it is not too bad. Whew, my goodness gracious. All right, there you have it everybody. A daily ride on the devil. Shop doors open. There he must be working on something. Let's listen to this engine one more time. Is that angry enough for you? It's pretty angry. If, uh, if it's not angry enough for you, you can get an aftermarket exhaust for a few thousand bucks, I think, and, 
it'll probably make even more ridiculous noises. Okie dokie, everybody. Let's dive into some Instagram questions now that I've caught my breath. Uh, first one here is from Real Mitch Meacham, who says, Who is this motorcycle for? Respectfully submitted by an MT09 owner. <laughs> Ultimately, what I would say to, to anyone who has a question like this is that the MT09 is built toward a purpose, and a lot of what that purpose is is fun right? The MT-09 is great because it has an awesome engine <laughs> uh, and it handles pretty well. And it, you know, when you leave a stoplight or you go up an on-ramp or you leave a corner on your favorite mountain road and you open the throttle and it goes, Wah! and you get that feel of like, wow, this thing is really cool and I'm having fun. Um, the Diablo delivers that well. Also, <laughs> frankly, um, it's, it's designed to, instead of, um, give you sort of a, a little tickle of fun or or make the hairs in the back of your neck stand up a little bit like an M209 does. This thing is made to truly kind of, it's a shock and awe campaign <laughs> for motorcycle acceleration. It's, it's truly wild uh, to hold on to the bike when you're accelerating as fast as it'll go. And um, it's special in the motorcycle world because of that. So it serves a different purpose than an MT-09, certainly, but ultimately it drives at the same thing, which is, which is fun on two wheels. So yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's too broad an answer, but hopefully that helps shed a little bit of light. Uh, next question is from Major Lama, who asks, long term, would you rather own this bike or a Triumph Rocket 3? I feel like long term, the Italian's, Italian maintenance bills might start to stack up. So friendly reminder, what I mentioned about the valve service intervals on this bike, totally different than um, servicing belts and servicing Desmo valve train on previous Diablo models. This Gran Turismo V4 is kind of a kind of a standalone in the <laughs> in the world of is it 47,000 kilometers, 49,000 kilometers, whatever. It's a long way. <laughs> um, and uh, oil changes every 9,000 miles, I think, or every two years on the Diablo V4. So is your Ducati dealer going to be more expensive by the hour than your Triumph dealer? Yeah, maybe. And are there going to be some things that could go wrong with this bike that wouldn't on a Triumph Rocket 3? Yeah, maybe. I'm not promising that. But there are some things that it has that you have to admit are pretty uh, cutting edge and um, and bold in the world of, of motorcycles and specifically maintenance. Which one would I, I rather own? Uh, I gotta go with the Diablo. I gotta do it. I love the Triumph Rocket 3. I think the Rocket 3 is such an awesome bike and I love that just ridiculous, absurd stump pulling torque and you can just like yeah, spin the tire like almost whenever you want to. It's such a ridiculous and incredible, unique riding experience. But I would be drawn to the Diablo because of the the sharper handling and the the lighter weight and it just speaks to the the sporting heritage that i have in my own history <laughs> and that brings us to our next question which is from pj ripple um who asks do you feel this bike needs to exist or it just falls in the realm of quote we did it because we can yeah that's where i was going with that whole thing about the triumph rocket 3 and this bike i mean all motorcycles mostly are we did it because we can right like even real mitch meacham are you using your mt09 instead of a Honda Civic? Probably not, right? I don't know, aren't we all just doing this because we can? Because we think it's fun? <laughs> I think that's one of the things that I really love about the Diablo and the Diablo V4 specifically, is that it doesn't answer a question that anyone asked, but when you ride it, you think, holy smokes, this is really, really fun in a way that I haven't experienced before. So I think to answer your question, Yes, it falls in that realm, and I love it for that. Last question this time around is from Nick Goodwin, 1979. Does this bike make you feel like a hero or more of a villain? Great question. Gosh, just driving it, this really nebulous, difficult thing to untangle, right? Do you, do you, <laughs> I love this question. Um, I think it, uh, it's got villain vibes. I think that's I think that's the that that's what it has, but in the best possible way, right? I don't think it encourages you to break the law or anything like that. Like it, it sort of does that, to be honest. But, but really, what it is is it's kind of unpredictable, and it's a little bit uh, off kilter, right? It's a it's a little bit of a cross threaded concept to begin with, that I have trouble defining in general. It's it's the sportiest cruiser that you can get basically it's the it's the lowest fattest widest weirdest naked sport bike that you can get sort of and i think that that's what makes it really feel like a comic book villain to me because it has that like unpredictability like that you're not sure which way it's going to jump next the feeling of it it's like what is it you're not sure you're confused and uh, and um and also like a little bit demonic and uh, and of course the name lends itself to that too so yeah it's got villain vibes but in the best possible way. All right, thanks again for all the awesome questions. Uh, I'm gonna jump inside to the Daily Rider leaderboard and we'll see where this sucker falls. 
Yo, right, everybody, here we are inside RevZilla West. Actually, exciting stuff going on behind the Daily Rider leaderboard here. See all this business? Holy crap, yeah, there's Ari Henning over there. There's a scooter carcass. What are we doing? Uh, you'll have to wait until um, January 24 to find out. But I was about to promise you it'd be exciting. I can't promise it. It'll probably be pretty fun, right? Anyway, more to the point, we've got a Ducati Diablo V4 ready to go on the Daily Rider leaderboard here. It gets dicey trying to figure out where a motorcycle lands, especially one like the Diablo V4, which as you can see here, gets a um, little flame icon and a price icon because it is both spicy and pricey. There's one argument you can make with the Diablo V4 that it is a sort of a low seat. I mean, a 31 inch seat isn't low, but like it's approachable from a seat height perspective. Um, it's got a low center of gravity as, as uh, cruiser type bikes often do. It's uh, fairly polite and uh, easy to ride around town, especially if you're in sort of an urban mode or rain mode or something like that. Uh, and it doesn't, there isn't anything it doesn't do. It's sort of comfortable, it's relaxed, it's powerful, it's, it's good, good bike, right? Good daily rider. On the other hand, it is super expensive. It is aggressive. It's a little bit, um, you know, rowdy, raucous sometimes in a way that um, isn't something I would necessarily recommend for every old person. I think where we should start is right here, Kawasaki Eliminator. Those of you who uh, watch a, a lot of Daily Riders will remember the Kawasaki Eliminator was on, it was either the last episode or two episodes ago. And I might have even mentioned in this episode that the Eliminator feels kind of like a baby Ducati Diablo. It's a not really a sport bike, not really a cruiser. It's sort of a little standard -y little motorcycle that works pretty well. And it's great for the same reasons the Diablo is great. However, the Eliminator is much cheaper, much more approachable financially and physically. It's a little tricky to say where it goes with relation to the Diablo. I think you gotta say the Diablo is a bigger, better, badder Eliminator. So we're gonna, it's gonna go above the Eliminator. The next question is if it's better than any of these bikes. Would I rather commute to work every day on a Ducati Diablo V4 than a Kawasaki Z650 RS? Yeah, definitely, no question. Then an SV650? Yeah, I, I would, how, how could you not? It's, it's so just sort of like vicious in all the right ways and terrifically engaging and powerful and, and, uh, and fun. But there aren't very many people realistically that I would recommend a Diablo V4 to. It's just, it's just a, it's a polarizing bike. It's like, yeah, it's expensive and rowdy and kind of wild. And if you said, what would you recommend a Bonneville T100 or a Diablo V4? I'd have to go Bonneville T100. I'd have to go Z650 RS. It's just too reasonable, too good, too affordable, too comfortable, too handsome. It's too good. Same thing with the CB500X. Is it possible? that I would recommend a CB500X over a Ducati Diablo V4? It sounds ridiculous to say it out loud, but it's true. If I don't know who you are, if I don't know what you're doing, if I don't know where you're going, if I don't know where you live, I'm probably gonna recommend a CB500X just because it's, it's more reasonable and it's more versatile and it's, and it's more polite. It seems weird, right? But that's what we're gonna do. Here, we're gonna, we're gonna put the Diablo V4 on the Daily Rider leaderboard and it is gonna go above the Kawasaki Eliminator because it is basically a larger Eliminator, which is quite a compliment. I mean, ranking the Diablo V4 above the Street Fighter V2 is almost difficult for me to do because in some ways the Street Fighter V2 is more versatile than a Diablo. You can, you can take it to a track day. It's like a sort of a true sport bike um, that you can also ride to work but I'll give the Diablo the nod because, because it's approachable and it has all that sort of um, technology laced into it that's, uh, that's so kind of helpful day to day. So yeah, there you go. Seems like a weird spot for that bike maybe. Is the V-Strom 800 that much better than the Diablo V4? Not in my opinion, but, uh, but the Daily Rider leaderboard does not live to serve me. It lives to serve you. So there you have it, Diablo V4. On the, on the Daily Rider leaderboard. Only a bike or two left to go here in 2023, and then we'll do a wrap-up video and dive right into 2024. In the meantime, thanks for hanging out for that ride. I hope you had fun, I hope you learned something. See you next time on Daily Rider. Just for a little bit of bonus content here, this button up here in the right grip puts uh, launch control on. We'll do Ducati Power Launch 
One, first gear, wide open, dump the clutch. <laughs> it's just a really reasonable daily rider is what I'm trying to say. 